Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. As soon as it is safe, we'll invite people back to the Yacht Club, and we hope that in the meantime, you're safe and sound with your family, uh, away from any of the virus, and um, taking care of yourself and your family. Today's program is unusual in many aspects. A considerable number of our programs lately have dealt with the environment. This program today is an ambitious attempt at building a program, including a research vessel, to monitor the health of the oceans. And we have several expert speakers uh, to bring to you, including two speakers and a gallery of five others for the Q&A session afterwards. We'll hear from Brian Ackerman, who is uh, Director of Marine Operations at the Moss Landing Marine Labs. And we'll hear from Jody Watt, who is Executive Director of Ocean Planet Explorers. Uh, Jody Watt was literally born on a boat. And by the time he was a teenager, was engaged in boat building and even composite construction of boat building, and has become basically a bit of an expert in that field. All through his childhood, he was involved in boat construction, literally dropped out of high school in South Africa to become a boat builder and uh, is a credit to the organization today. So Jody, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Tell us all about the great adventure that you guys have embarked on. Thank you, Ron. Um, yeah, again, my name is Jody Watt. I'm the director of, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, executive director of Ocean Plan Explorers. Um, and uh, Brian Ackerman and I are here to introduce Ocean Plan Explorers and the OPE 111 Spartan Pride. Um, I will begin by, uh, again, explaining what Ocean Planet Explorer is all about, and then we'll merge into uh, Brian Ackerman, who will talk about uh, the OP-111 and Mossy Labs, and et cetera. Um, our mission is to inspire stewardship and sea through inquiry-based learning and assist research efforts aboard low-impact vessels created to help solve the challenges facing our ocean planet. Um, we're, we, we are the marine, we think, I like to think of ourselves as the marine science community's one-stop shop for custom tool fabrication, charters vessels, uh, marine science education, and research vessel construction management. Um, we're, we essentially were a group of individuals uh, from many different aspects of the marine industry um, that have come together that have seen the, the, the deterioration of our environment, um, and we all want to kind of put, put our, you know, our hard our effort in to try to improve the health of our oceans. Um, uh, the long-term goal of Ocean Planet Explorers is to have uh, multiple vessels uh, across the U.S. Um, as a fleet um, that will be managed by one hub um, and, uh, and uh, serve tens of thousands of youth um, and many marine science research organizations uh, nationwide. Um, the, the, marine, the marine science community is many different parts um, and Ocean Planet Explorers plans to bring them together um, in, under one organization. Um, and of course, that's science, education, awareness, um, and solutions. Um, the science aspect, the science uh, service that, uh, or the service that uh, Ocean Planet Schools will bring to the science community um, is to provide um, efficient non-invasive vessels, tools, um, and citizen science data uh, to, to the marine um, research community. Um, and so that, of course, involves the non-invasive vessels um, and data sharing. Um, uh, you know, and that's uh, data we collect by our education program. Um, the education program uh, was developed to, uh, to expand the horizons of individuals, anybody, um, uh, regardless of age, by helping them gain a better understanding of the incredible biodiversity um, in our oceans. Um, our particular education program is called Sail for Science. Um, you know, we cover a very diverse uh, uh, amount of uh, scientific fields, um, participant run, um, and uh, we have a very diverse curriculum that's adaptable, uh, depending on the needs of the school or the organization. Um, uh, and we also provide funding assistance uh, for the schools because we don't, we feel that uh, just because a school or organization does not have the money to pay for, get these, get these youth out on the water and broaden their horizons and understand the incredible world of the oceans, uh, funding should not be a limitation. Um, awareness. Um, the other aspect of the course is just promoting it to the general public, um, you know, promoting the awareness to companies and many, you know, uh, just everybody in general. Um, and uh, we'll accomplish this by eco tours, uh, whale watching, Caroline Islands trips, et cetera. Um, introduce to the business of the corporations uh, by team building trips, get them on board so that they can spend their dollars towards uh, helping, uh, um, you know, support the, uh, the environment and, uh, and, and learning about it. Um, 
scuba diving trips and cage diving trips um, and uh, naturalist expeditions on the bay, you know, and, and just learning about the history of the bay and, and so on and so forth. Um, now we get into solutions uh, to facilitate the creation of low resistant vessel tools, equipment, which glide as opposed to plow their way through the environment. Um, uh, these vessels uh, are, are the, the hull shapes are low resistance, um, and we use the power of the wind, um, so uh, so not, as not to be as intrusive, um, you know, to the marine ecosystem. Um, uh, the OP fleet will consist to start with right now, which is the Wiley 65, which is already in operation. Uh, the OPE Silence, which is actually under construction, um, and we our fleet will be primarily of the OPE Silence um, vessels, um, and uh, and we have a we have a, a sharing program. Um, that where uh, OPE will not own the vessels, will be owned by private individuals that then OPE will utilize to, to, uh, to conduct the marine science, marine science program, uh, sail for science, and to provide these vessels to science organizations, regardless of affiliation or, um, you know, uh, financial status. So um, uh, that's, uh, that's essentially the fleet. Now that second half of that, um, of our solutions is of course, is, is management of construction for research vessels. Um, and that gets in now, of course, now that's getting into the OP-111. Um, the OP, this is a, a partnership between uh, Moss Island Marine Labs and Ocean Planet Explorers. Um, uh, Ocean Planet Explorers will uh, manage the construction of the vessel and when, upon completion will be donated uh, to Moss, Moss Island Marine Labs. Um, as we are both nonprofit organizations, we've established a partnership. Um, I would like to have honored to introduce uh, Brian Ackerman, um, uh, Marine Operations Manager from Moss Marine Laboratories. And uh, Brian, take it away. Thank you, Jody. It's a pleasure to be here today. I uh, wish we could do it in person, but uh, uh, we could do it virtually just as, uh, just as well uh, today. Um, what I uh, want to talk about is where I'm coming from as the uh, Marine Operations Manager for Moss Signing Marine Laboratories. Moss Landing Marine Labs is uh, the uh, School of Ocean Science uh, for uh, the College of Science at San Jose State University, uh, as well as a consortium of other uh, campuses. Um, so I'm very, very pleased uh, to introduce to you uh, the Tom Wiley designed uh, Ocean Planet Explorer 111 uh, that, that we're uh, tentatively naming uh, the Spartan Pride. This is a uh, a new way of, uh, of approaching ocean research. I'm currently working for Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, uh, the little lab that could, as we call it here in uh, the heart of Monterey Bay in Moss Landing. We are the Graduate School of Ocean Science for the uh, College of Science for San Jose State University. Uh, we are also a consortium campus. There are uh, six other CSUs that uh, um, are involved uh, with our operation. We offer a master's uh, degree in ocean science. Um, uh, we are also currently uh, in negotiations with uh, uh, UC um, uh, Santa Cruz in uh, developing a, a PhD program uh, for ocean science. We have uh, several small boats right now. I'm sitting on the John H. Martin as we speak. Uh, the Point Sur was a 135-foot uh, uh, vessel, um, uh, would travel between the Bering Sea and the Antarctic. Uh, she was a great boat for us uh, for a number of reasons. One is that she was large enough to take an entire class uh, out for a class cruise. That's one of our missions is uh, education. And so both undergraduate and graduate classes would go out on the Point Sur uh, and uh, learn about uh, uh, ocean science. Um, she also did a lot of work for a lot of other organizations, including the National Science Foundation and NOAA, uh, Navy Postgraduate School. That vessel was owned by NSF and managed by uh, Moss Island Marine Labs. National Science Foundation sold that boat in 2014 to uh, uh, University of Southern Mississippi, and that boat went away. So the reason why we're even uh, looking at a Tom Wiley vessel right now, or any vessel, uh, is because we want to replace the capability of the Point Sur. That's a very important point, though, is that whatever, whatever vessel we build uh, has to have at least the same capabilities as uh, the other vessels that we've got in our fleet, including the Point Sur. So, but Tom Wiley uh, uh, very wisely has this quote, why are we using Humvees to study butterflies in the rainforest? In other words, we're bringing these huge 
uh, uh, diesel powered vehicles out onto the sea um, and kind of muscling our way uh, through ocean science. Um, Tom has a very unique uh, aspect on this and uh, is uh, uh, looking at uh, building a vessel that um, uh, will be much more easy on the ocean, uh, much more designed to flow with the ocean instead of fight it. Um, so the, uh, the Ocean Planet Explorer 111, the, uh, the Spartan Pride as we're calling her, um, is, uh, it kind of fits that bill. Uh, she has a very slippery hull. Tom has a lot of experience in building racing vessels. Uh, and so this, this particular hull is, uh, is very slippery and very, uh, 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 very fast. Uh, so to put that in perspective, uh, the boat that I'm on now, the John H. Martin, is uh, running two uh, 650 horsepower John Deere engines, and that pushes her at about 20, 22 knots. This vessel uh, will have uh, three generators, um, uh, each one about 250 kilowatts, so a total of 750 uh, uh, horsepower, more or less, or 750 kilowatts, be about 1,000 horsepower. Um, uh, but those, those generators can be switched on and off, uh, depending upon loads. Uh, there will also be a battery system, some sort of energy storage system, System, an energy management system, probably of a lithium uh, uh, chemistry of some sort, and then three uh, uh, electric thrusters. The two aft thrusters uh, will be uh, azimuthing, 360 degree azimuthing. The forward uh, thruster uh, uh, will be a drop down azimuthing thruster. So when we're under sail, uh, that one will be retracted up into the hull. So what this does is it allows us to uh, operate silently um, uh, for a number of hours. Uh, uh, my goal is to be able to uh, run this boat for eight hours at, at uh, three knots uh, on battery power alone, so that if we are doing uh, uh, acoustic studies with cetaceans, uh, we can have a hydrophone in the water and uh, we won't have the diesel engine thrumming in the background. Uh, we'll just have a little bit of bubble, bubble wash uh, on the hull. Uh, uh, she has a uh, 11,000 pound or 10,000 pound uh, A-frame on the back. Uh, we are planning on using the, the uh, mizzen boom as another crane. Uh, it'll be hydraulically operated. Um, the sail controls will, will be uh, automated uh, to a great extent uh, so we can run with a small crew. This boat is going to be tough. Uh, we're building her uh, as a composite construction, uh, carbon fiber, Kevlar at the waterline on, on the leading edge of the keel and the rudder. Uh, uh, carbon fiber is uh, uh, five times lighter than steel of the same strength. Uh, the other advantage of this is that uh, it is a lot uh, easier to maintain. Uh, in my deckhand days, I spent countless hours on the working end of a needle gun and this vessel will not have to have that level of care. Um, once, uh, once she's in the water, um, she'll require a periodic call-outs uh, to refresh bottom paint. But even that um, will, be, uh, uh, will be different from what uh, is normal. Uh, typically, we use a blade of paints, uh, copper-based blade of paints. Uh, the, the bottom coating that I want to use on this uh, is... Uh, uh, glass platelets infused into uh, polyester resin. Um, the company that makes this uh, EcoShield has a 10-year warranty between haul-outs. So typically a haul-out is every two years. Uh, this will be about 10 years between haul-outs. Uh, and uh, the, more that you, uh, the more that you polish it, uh, and it can be polished with a little ROV that just mows the lawn essentially up and down the hull, the harder and slicker uh, the coating becomes. This boat has a, a lot of deck space, as much deck space as the Point Lobos did. Um, uh, it has a great deal of lab space because it's not all tank. Uh, the below decks area um, is uh, open for laboratory or bunk rooms. Um, we're going to make the uh, machinery spaces modular uh, in nature so that uh, you can open up some uh, soft patches on the deck and uh, remove uh, or replace 
uh, machinery as technology advances. Uh, for example, we can get rid of the diesel generators and put in uh, hydrogen fuel cells and hydrogen generators. So we want to make this as easy as possible. Those, uh, that machinery as well will all be in uh, sound enclosures on uh, flexible mounts um, so that, uh, and with tabletops on top, so that it's actually the machinery space uh, will also be uh, double as lab space. So a very, very capable vessel, strong, fast, able to motor at 15 knots. The point sir could, could make nine. Um, the uh, sail under sail can make 22 knots. Uh, that's the uh, speed of the John Martin. Uh, big, tough A-frame. Uh, we might, uh, we're going to have a UNOL, what's called a UNOL's deck pattern of uh, sockets on the deck so that we can bolt down various machinery on two foot centers. So we can put a, uh, uh, another knuckle boom crane on if we needed it for a particular mission uh, that would just bolt in into place. So the, the major benefits of this boat, uh, the increased range because uh, you, can, you can utilize the wind. Um, unsurpassed maneuverability, uh, we're designing this so that uh, um, it'll be computer controlled, called a dynamic position. Uh, system so that uh, uh, in 25 knots of wind on the beam and a uh, three knot current, uh, the boat can maintain uh, uh, 10 meters of, uh, of uh, geographic positioning. Uh, that's extremely important when you're trying to lower a delicate instrument uh, with pinpoint accuracy to the bottom of the sea floor two miles deep. Um, silent operation, uh, low operational and maintenance costs. Uh, the vessel is probably going to be a little more expensive to build. Uh, because of the uh, types of uh, uh, materials that we're using. Um, uh, however, in the, uh, in the long run and throughout the life of the vessel, which should be at least 50 years, um, uh, the, uh, the maintenance costs will be uh, very much lower than traditional steel or aluminum hull vessel. Uh, expansive lab deck and cargo space and a efficient and flexible uh, deck arrangement. So we all know what the problems are. We, we read about them in the news all the time. Uh, climate change, ocean acidification, uh, the, it hits home locally. You know, Dungeness crabs are suffering because uh, uh, their shells are, are having a hard time developing their shells because of all the uh, acid in the water. Um, uh, krill, uh, krill feeds uh, the world essentially. Uh, have, they have very, very delicate exoskeletons. If, uh, if there's too much uh, carbon dioxide side in the water um, and eats away at that, uh, at that krill shell and we lose that species, um, we are pretty much game over for uh, the rest of the planet uh, because they feed everything. They're the, they're the basis of the food web. Um, so we, this kind of uh, research that, uh, that we're doing needs to be done. Um, we need to have a way of doing it and not, uh, um, uh, not to disrupt the environment while we're doing it. Um, and um, so that's uh, that's where we're at. And uh, so we all know the problems and uh, it's time to uh, come up with some solutions. Um, there's a, a website that you can go to uh, that uh, uh, will be live by the time you see this. So uh, I, I recommend uh, that you all go visit that, uh, visit Moss and Moon Labs uh, website and uh, find out what we're doing. Thank you, Brian. We'll now hear from Ocean Explorer's panel of experts. The first of which is Tom Wiley. Tom is a very innovative naval architect, the creator of the Hawk Farm, the Wiley Wabbit, the Wiley Cat Boats. You can get in a Wiley 30 cat boat and beat your buddy's crude sailboats of the same size and even bigger. The Wiley 34s, the Wiley 39, which is um, one of which is Commodore Tompkins' cool flash girl, um, Lois Lane, many fast cruising boats, including Randy Repass's cool ride with which he just circumnavigated the planet, uh, and the Derek Bayless, the 65-foot research craft stationed in Monterey. So Tom, the assignment was design an environmentally conscious research craft that you could use to, you know, circle the planet. And uh, you designed an 111-foot cat catch and when the wind doesn't blow, it's got electric motors. 
What do you like most about it? The lowest carbon footprint, which is, as uh, been indicated, you know, the root of the cause of acidification climate change. It's also great uh, for silence. Silence is uh, important, certainly, because I believe the uh, sound travels five times more efficiently in the water than the air. Why I picked this rig, I've designed all kinds of rigs in my career for a cruise around the world, couple circuit, three circum navigations, one actually now in a sister ship of the Derek Bayless, which is all but complete. Um, it's called Man Hours. And I started that design to try to get rid of the crew on the rail back in the early 80s uh, in a 30 footer. And um, now using that kind of design will make Brian's job and Emily's job and uh, Jim Harvey's job a lot easier to pay for with less people. It's called, uh, rather than your friends as crew, it's called uh, a paycheck every Friday. I think that kind of sums it up. <laughs> Zan Drages, you and I have gone 37 knots on Ocean Racing Trimaran and, and uh, almost that fast in uh, professional catamarans. What is it that attracts you to this project? Well, I'm excited to see someone that's got the fearless vision to build a sail powered work boat that can actually get the job done. I mean, you look at the west coast of uh, North America and the wind, the potential to use the wind is just, it's untapped. And um, Tom's already got the Derek Bayless out doing work and uh, I've had the pleasure of operating it. And it's, I don't know any other uh, research boat or work boat that's got it's primarily sail powered that can get the job done like the Derek Bayless can. I mean, it can, it's got a working deck right down on the water and it, you can get from here to the middle of the Pacific high in on um, 20 gallons of diesel and uh, things faster than most uh, diesel powered boats will go. That thing can get to Hawaii on 35 gallons of diesel in average over 10 knots on the way there it's nobody's doing it or done it and it's there's a just an incredible potential for uh, this especially we're just blessed to have this wind that blows strong down the coast from the same direction 300 days a year you can set your clock by it and uh, you can power out and plus all the french racers now are using uh hydro generators to make electricity for even for their around the world race boats because they've tried solar they've tried wind power uh, wind you know windmills on the boat wind generators and the water is so much more efficient to repower i mean we have the potential to repower the batteries on this thing with the sails that they're using to get where they're going it just seems like a, a couldn't i mean this everything is just lining up to uh, make this um, an incredibly wonderful project. I'm not a scientist, but uh, throughout my lifetime, since I was a teenager, I've been going back and forth across the Pacific. And in the early times, it was exciting. We'd get excited if we saw one piece of trash in the ocean. Like we thought that was exciting just to see one man-made object floating there. And over 45 years, 50 years, it's, the entire ocean filled up. We we are sailing through trash all the way across the ocean. You see, and the ability. It, and I've worked with the scientists on the Bayless, and to get out to the Pacific Gyre is not an easy task. And I would imagine it's pretty damn expensive to take a big ship out there. And you have the potential to get out there from Moss Landing in four and a half days with zero fuel cost to make the ocean accessible to these scientists in, in, with a vessel like this just seems like an incredible opportunity. Great. So James Harvey, you're the director of Moss Landing Marine Labs for San Jose State's College of Science. Talk to us about why San Jose State is excited about this opportunity. Well, thank you, Ron. Yeah, um, Moss Landing's really excited about this because uh, we've been operating for over 50 years in Monterey Bay, uh, studying ocean um, systems around the world. And we've had a variety of different types of vessels over that time frame. Um, all of them, as we've talked about, are uh, mostly been 
uh, operated using fuel. And it's really exciting for us to start thinking about a new way of doing science, research and education um, around the coastlines. And that's uh, to use a vessel like um, Tom and others have been developing here. It's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for Moss Landing Marine Labs and San Jose State University to um, demonstrate to the world that research can be done in a much more sustainable ma manner um, and give us opportunities to um, demonstrate to our students too how to do research with a, um, a responsibility that we all have for the environment. And we very much view that this vessel is not only going to serve San Jose State University and Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, but the state of California. We hope to, to use this vessel up and down the coastline and help, help um, put students from Southern California, Northern California, Central California out on the water to learn more about what we need to do to, to save our planet, but also to teach, teach them how to do it in a responsible way. So uh, Emily Lane, and I see your name, you've got somebody else's name, Olivia Shoemaker on here, Emily, but we all know that you're really Emily Lane, uh, Director of Development for the College of Science at San Jose State. Tell us, what's the startup budget and thereafter the annual budget? And secondly, where are you going to get the money? Director of Development, that means you got you got to go get the bucks. That's right. And I wish I had a money tree for all of this, but that, that hasn't been invented yet. Uh, so we are right now in the beginning phases of our capital campaign, and that is for the entire university, not just for Moss Landing Marine Labs. However, uh, I would say a large majority of our 10-year plan is dedicated to Moss Landing and expanding out not just the, the vessel and the, the dock needed to, uh, uh, to house the vessel, but also the entire uh, labs and area itself. So I'm not gonna be the one to talk exact dollars, but I will say um, from, from what I've heard over the past few months, we're talking about a total investment of uh, between 100 and 120 million for the entire project with the vessel itself being around 20 to 22. And uh, please, anyone on here, <laughs> correct my numbers if they if they are uh, different than that. So Kim Dessenberg, great sailor, boat builder, um, you know, Stanford sailing team alum. Uh, talk to us about the day in the life of, of uh, Spartan Pride. How is this boat going to be used? You can take students as you do the scientific research, correct? Right. It would be for the researchers to uh, access the ocean uh, and the range of this boat is pretty much unlimited anywhere around the world that, that they choose to use it for. Um, but also for the education, which is more, more day trips uh, for people to be introduced to the ocean, uh, for their students to be introduced to the ocean. And so um, Tom Wiley, I noticed on the drawings of the boat that it's got these thrusters, the bow thruster uh, comes down into the water when you use it, I note. And these are 360 degree thrusters. So there's one in the forward, one aft, and where's the, where's the third one? I couldn't see it in the drawings. Good, good question, Ron. There is a third one, and the reason you don't see it, it's in the boat. The third one is on the left side, or port side, as they call it, and air, 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 air companies and ocean companies. Port side um, is retracted. And so it's flush with the bottom of the boat and actually all of them will be capable of being flush with the bottom of the boat. Um, and Brian did a great job describing staying on station, why we want to be. Look at them, <laughs> look at them. Why we want to be um, uh, 360 degree rotation. Uh, he did a really good job of that. Um, so he, we can stay on station. Uh, one of the things he didn't mention is, boy, is this boat going to be so easy to dock. It can jam into the harbor at, well, come on, Sam, seven, eight knots if you want to come to a stop, make a right-hand turn 90 degrees and be docked, which is great. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure Sam will do it too, if he, a little practice out in the ocean. But uh, the other thing that uh, Sam really alluded to with the French piloting, is this boat will easily be doing 10 and 15 all the time out in the ocean, ocean, open ocean under sail? Well, Brian doesn't want to go that fast. Fine. What speed do you want to go, Brian? Well, I want to go forward today. Fine. Sam's going 10, 15, minus four. That, all that speed 
we dropped all three props, even though we're not using them to motor the boat, and we charge up our batteries. And this part of the technology is certainly being played with here or there in the world by wizards. You know, California isn't the only state with wizards, but we're going to be really one of the first people with a boat that will sail like a witch and motor like a witch. It's pretty cool. So, Brian, you're going to basically be generating power using the sails and driving the props through the water, essentially yeah. like a windmill underwater. Effectively. Right. So, uh, if, the, if you had no wind, how long could you cruise the boat at what speed? And then tell me how much you think in terms of wattage you'll be generating when you're sailing the boat. Right. So, so a lot of that uh, is still to be determined uh, by engineers. I'm working with uh, BAE Systems, uh, who did the, uh, uh, the uh, propulsion system on the Matthew Turner uh, up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, that's a hybrid, uh, serial hybrid design uh, with electric, uh, electric thruster, uh, diesel generator, and a battery system. It all depends on, on uh, uh, how many batteries we can fit on board and the size of that bank. Um, my, I'm hoping that we can get uh, eight hours of operation at four knots uh, under electric power alone. Um, the generators will be auto start and they'll come online as needed. Um, uh, and we'll also have solar panels on the uh, 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 house trunk uh, to pick up any of that. We might be able to uh, put some solar panels in the sails themselves. Um, I have to look at that uh, technology and see uh, how uh... Suzanne, this is not a racing craft, though you and I've gone real fast in racing machines. This boat's, but it's got two big giant cat sails. <clears throat> What's the size of a crew to sail this boat? Sail handling wise, it's, that's the beauty of all the unstayed rigs and the uh, cat boat is you're going to have two big power winches and uh, two people, basically, if, if you've got all your sail up. And uh, it's pretty simple. I mean, that's that's the beauty of it. It's a it's a work boat, and uh, you want to take have a bunch of crew that needs to be sail handling. So what your point is unstayed mass, meaning those of us who know and who sailed these boats with unstayed mass, as the wind blows up, the top of the mass bends, part of Tom's design, and it basically releases energy uh, spills off the top of the sail with twist and the boat doesn't heel over as much and basically keeps going through the water. So talk a little bit about what it's like to sail with state, unstayed mass like this. Well, it's nice. You don't need runners. You don't need hydraulics. And uh, it's just a one sheet operation on it. And it's, a, it's also very sea kindly because the, the boat, as the rigs flex, uh, it just dampens the the uh, forces on the hull and it makes for a, a more gentle ride in the in big seas and it, it's just the simplest I mean we raced the Bayless with just two guys and uh, it, it was easy and uh, and the boat moves fast I mean it's a it's a real opportunity to build a boat that can that can compete with a well, it's, it'll just be revolutionary in that you'll, you have an opportunity to, to show people the direction to go. Like even with smaller sail powered fishing boats, the potential for this on the, just especially on the West Coast here is, is incredible. And completely, this is just gonna, I think, open a window to people's, to see what can be done uh, with a sail powered work boat. So, Tom, this boat's 111 feet long. How much is it going to weigh, and how much is in the keel? Well, there's two weights. When it goes day sailing, it'll be about 185,000 pounds, and in the keel will be in the neighborhood of 20 and 25 percent, or in the low 40, 45,000 pounds of lead. Um, then the other weight is actually part of the maintenance. Um, there are 14 travelists on the West Coast that Jody has researched. This is a way to easily pull a boat up if you have a problem as far south as Santiago, Chile, and some up in Alaska, 14 total. 
And so this boat will, when it gets a certain amount of load, will be 100 metric tons. And that's when the buzzer goes off um, on, uh, on these travel lifts. So it's, a, it's kind of a production way to haul a small ship. So I changed the beam of the boat in order to fit into, actually, Kim Desenberg's yard has one of these travel lifts, 23 feet wide, 100 metric ton, which is about 220,000 pounds. So it, there's a lot of simple um, simplicity, uh, Ron, behind your question, as you can tell. It's going to be so, easy to own. So with these 360 degree props, three of them, you basically right. could parallel park the boat so totally. laterally sideways going into the dock. Yep. Yeah, so when you when Zan's trying to get into Kim's travel lift, it's going to be the it's going to be really hilarious because they're going to be able to after the first time they do it with the mizzen mast comes close for for example, but after the first one or two times, Zan's going to put this in the travel lift as easy as he could put a forty footer in, <laughs> and that's not bad. They charge by the hour. You know, so so James Harvey, talk to me a little bit about uh, San Jose State's ability to be able to get press about having such an environmentally friendly research vessel, kind of pioneeringly friendly in terms of the environmental uh, friendliness. And tell us what else you might like about this project. All right, yeah, Moss Landing Marine Labs is is world world known. Uh, we um, work around the world, as I said, and lots of people know about us. Um, having a vessel of this capability and this kind of hybrid um, design will, will be a, a game changer for us. And I hope it will be a game changer for research uh, worldwide. Uh, we hope that us demonstrating to the rest of the world that you can build a vessel and have this kind of capabilities that we will demonstrate and hopefully we'll modify the vessel over time to again, to make sure that it's doing what we want it to do that eventually um, I think the rest of the world will understand that this is the right way to go as far as new research vessels. Um, so we're very excited about it and I'm sure that we'll be able to be, do a very good job of advertising to the rest of the world what we're doing. We're gonna do all kinds of things to not only demonstrate uh, and, and work on the vessel, but then um, sell that basically that concept to the rest of the world also by providing them with ideas of how the, wor the, wor the vessel operates how well it, it's uh, efficiently it's being operated. So we're gonna collect a lot of data as we're, we're, at, we're not only gonna collect data that are environmentally as we study ocean science, but we're also gonna collect data on the ship itself, the vessel to understand how well it's working um, for us and then use those, those data to, to let the rest of the world know um, how, how great the vessel is and that they should get one too. <laughs> so Kim Desenberg, give us a kind of a timeline for this project. Uh, you know, what are, the, what are the next milestones over what period of time before the boat is uh, funded, built, and in operation? Well, uh, we hope that it will be uh, created and operational in the next five years, maybe the next three years. Uh, it certainly depends on the funding from uh, San Jose State and the, and the science, uh, uh, College of Science, um, that it can't be done without that. <laughs> and then it's probably a two, two to three year project from start to finish to uh, get the finish uh, drawings done and, and start the building of the boat. Where do you guys plan to build a boat? We hope on the West Coast. Uh, it would be great if it's California. We don't know if that will happen, but it might be up in Washington. Uh, with Jim right. Beth's yard or, or there are several op opportunities we have. Yes, to Brian. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to make this a California boat. Um, yeah. uh, much of the, uh, uh, the components of this boat are going to be farmed out to other, uh, other companies. It'll be more efficient to build parts of it uh, and then assemble it in one location. Uh, we are really fortunate here in Moss Landing uh, that uh, there is a, a composite boat builder that's right here on the island uh, that builds a number of... Uh, of vessels, mostly catamarans for the uh, for the charter trade. Um, uh, Left Coast Composites is the name of that that uh, company. Um, uh, but also uh, Jody's uh, uh, 
Jody's company, Ocean Planet Explorers, uh, will be supplying us with uh, the parts, maybe the maybe the deck house uh, bulkheads, that sort of thing, uh, and then we'll assemble it all here in Moss Landing. Um, uh, we are blessed in Santa Cruz in the Santa Cruz area, the Monterey Bay area, but especially Santa Cruz, um, is kind of the mecca uh, of composite boat building on the West Coast. Um, there are a ton of very, very talented people uh, that are here uh, on the West Coast uh, that would, uh, that could be involved in this project. And I think that, you know, I'm, uh, I, a lot of times uh, uh, these vessels are being now built overseas in Spain and Turkey um, uh, to save money. Uh, I, I think we can actually save a lot of money by building it locally. Um, uh, the, Why do you the say that? Well, I say that because I say that because the opportunities are here, and the and the manpower is here, and the talent is here. Um, uh, if you build a boat in a foreign country, uh, you have to have an advanced team that's there uh, monitoring that uh, monitoring that ship build, uh, and then you have to commission and deliver it at some point. All of that adds to the cost. Um, uh, and, you know, we have the talent here in California, we have the people, uh, and I, I think that we could build it here cheaper than we could if we were to go elsewhere. Tom, what's the hull construction going to be made of? Uh, the hull will be largely fiberglass, but as Brian indicated, uh, there'll be areas where we're interested in impact resistant that'll have um, Kevlar in it. There'll be areas of the hull where we just want to stiffen something. Um, and then we'll use much like a steel I-beam that the world's pretty familiar with where you have a flange that of steel, we'll just change that flange to, to carbon. So they'll, and, and much, you can't see through the paint with composite, but we're able to taper composite laminate to put the expensive material like carbon exactly where the, the strain, you know, is. So we'll be able to globally engineer the entire whole laminate. It'll have core probably at the moment, uh, the majority of the core would be um, Core Cell as a brand name, um, which is a, a, a foam brand name. A lot of experience with that. But one of the things I've done my whole career is not fought the actual mechanic, no matter who they are. And so the input from the mechanic is going to influence what we as engineers and designers do. So Emily, there are capital campaigns in every school and uh, schools, you know, uh, make their names sometimes by building buildings and or launching uh, cool programs uh, that basically advance science in a particular area. This project's got multiple aspects to it. It's environmentally interesting and in, in, in innovative and creative. It's also um, uh, you know, got some yacht design components to it that make uh, it e exciting. Tell me what is, how are you going to be able to sell this to potential funders and what kind of people would want to contribute to this kind of novel, innovative environmental program? Absolutely. I think that we have a kind of the, we are the best kept secret in terms of where we are located. Uh, we are, we're in the heart of Silicon Valley in San Jose. Um, people don't uh, necessarily think of us as uh, researchers or, innov or innovators, but we've actually been doing this for, uh, well, the College of Science itself is 87 years old and the university is 160. Uh, there's not a major company in Silicon Valley that doesn't have either a founder or a CXO level that is a San Jose State alum. Uh, we have uh, very active boards and on, ac across all colleges. And the great thing about this project is that uh, all said and done, it will be a, uh, a remote campus that is interdisciplinary in, na in nature. So the, co the College of Engineering, uh, Industrial Design, uh, Arts and Humanities will all have space in this, in, in this area that will bring uh, uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs just uh, abundance of more resources uh, than it currently has. And so whether it's public-private partnerships whether it's alums that just want to, you know, slap their logo on the boat. Um, and we, I, I joke around and say we're going to NASCAR this thing out. Um, I, I think that there's a, a number of opportunities for folks to continue to be engaged and to leave their legacy at Moss Landing Marine Labs. Great. Well, listen, it's been uh, quite exciting listening to you guys talk about this program. 
Jody, let's wrap up with you. Uh, please offer your uh, additional thoughts. It's a collaboration. Um, and so we're all just kind of working together to do fundraising. And of course, um, construction of the project uh, is, is in OP's hands with, of course, uh, discussions with uh, Brian and, and all involved. Um, and yeah, the more people we can get involved, the better. Um, anybody that's interested uh, can go to Ocean Planet Explorers um, uh, website, uh, opexplorers.org, um, and become involved. Uh, there's many different uh, types of involvement. Uh, for this project, we're actually uh, establishing a, uh, a construction committee, um, which, is in, which, uh, which has uh, engineers, designers, um, and uh, compliance experts. Uh, we, for the most part, have that assembled. Uh, but then we also, of course, uh, have another committee, which is just people that want to be involved with the project, uh, whether they want to add their time in or, you know, they want to be involved, help do some, you know, documentation work or outreach or, um, you know, so we're really kind of reaching out to the public to be a part of this of this vessel. Because again, the biggest challenge that we have had so far, um, I also have been managing the bales for the last uh, six years um, uh, under, under another company name, um, is, uh, is, um, is really getting that, um, uh, as James said, you know, kind of getting the word out there and kind of just getting people to understand that these vessels are going to save a lot of money. They're going to, you know, they're, they're much better on the ecosystem. You're not having this intrusion of noise and, you know, soot in the water and um, and they're much more efficient and, uh, and uh, you know, friendly on the environment and to people and manpower. Um, and so, yeah, so everybody, let's get involved, be a part of this. Um, it's an awesome project. It's going to be one of a kind vessel. Um, and uh, we're all really excited and looking forward to it. And we're all working hard to make it happen. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, but it's a collaboration. We're all together in this um, to make this happen. Um, so. So Brian and Jody from Moss Landing Marine Labs and Ocean Planet Explorers and uh, board members Kim and Skipper Zan and uh, Director Lee and uh, fundraiser Emily and designer Tom Wiley. It's been great having you as guests on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon Program. Um, we wish you the very best of fortune with your exciting environmentally oriented innovative project. And thank you very much for, for telling us your story on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And with that, the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon is adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye.